I was on this campus 24 years ago to teach as an adjunct professor at the seminary that's located on this same grounds. And while I was here, I met one of our IMB missionaries who with her husband was living here and serving. And as we got acquainted, she mentioned that there was a Kenyan employee who worked here on the, the grounds who was a pastor's wife. And this missionary wife befriended this Kenyan woman. They you know, talked about all sorts of things. And it became apparent this Kenyan woman was, she was very, she was very intelligent. She knew scripture. She was very solid as a disciple of Christ. And so one day in the conversation, um, the missionary wife says to this Kenyan woman, have you ever considered becoming a missionary? And the Kenyan woman was kind of startled. And she said, well, no, I'm not white. What do you think about that? You think that idea continues that somehow, in her mind at least, all the missionaries she had known to that point, and this was 24 years ago, so thank God things were changing. But as far as she was concerned, to be missionary meant to be white. And it was a tragedy. And fortunately, you know, we're talking here this week, and you know, Africa is rising, and Africa has been sending missionaries, is sending more, and you are gearing up to make that uh, an even more integral part of what you're doing. But what I'd like to do today is take that little vignette and just change it slightly. If I were to ask the students on your campus, hey, have you ever thought about being a Bible translator? What's the chance they would respond? Well, no, I'm not white. Do they think of Africans? as Bible translators. I mean, we know the reality is, yeah, sure, Bible, you know, Africans have been Bible translators. They are Bible translators. They are in other roles in Bible translation. But somehow, just you know, for lack of visual examples, we sometimes reach this, uh, assumptions. So what I'm here to do today is to just help you kind of dream of what could be. And I, I see what I'm saying as following right along the things that other presenters have said. Uh, Dr. Lawless made a strong appeal this morning to make missions an integral part of theological education. And essentially, the way to think about my talk is I'm arguing that Bible translation is an integral part of missions. So if he succeeded in his talk, I'm trying to piggyback in on that and get the benefit of his persuasiveness. So that's what I want to talk about, and just try to answer this question, what is the role of theological educators in these emerging models of Bible translation? I want to do briefly just some things I think are our shared convictions. I'm not going to elaborate them really, I'm just going to assert them. If you disagree, maybe you can talk at break time about them, but I think it provides a biblical and theological basis that's necessary. We're agreed that Jesus said that we are to teach His disciples to obey everything he taught them. To obey everything he taught implicitly also includes the Old Testament because he showed high regard for the Old Testament, treated it as Scripture. So, you know, if we're going to teach everything Jesus taught, then we have to have all of Scripture. Agreed? We have to know, uh, you know, have to be able to read it. And this is... It's an unfortunate consequence that some of the decisions made historically about translating just a New Testament uh, leads to some significant problems. Uh, just in one of those ironies of life, the man who was scheduled to speak in this hour is from Ghana. He's at a seminary in Tamale. And I had the invitation to speak there in 2002 when it was a, a, a Bible school. And I was telling stories from Scripture and trying to give an overview of the Bible in just three days. You know, one story after another, about 30 or 40 stories. And as we neared the, uh, I guess we came to the final day, they said, could you extend two more days and do some more Old Testament stories? And I said, well, no, you know, my travel schedule's already set, I can't. And they said, well, you know, we don't have an Old Testament in our language. 
And so all these stories you've told us from the Old Testament, are, are, they're, they're brand new. And you think about, in any context, what it's like not to have the whole of Scripture in a language people understand well. And just very tangibly. And it's, it's just my opinion. Obviously, I'm a foreigner. You're the Africans. But in my opinion, many of the most important issues in African life are addressed at least as powerfully in the Old Testament as in the New. Agreed? So we need all of Scripture in every language so that we can help people know um, know all of Jesus' teachings and obey them. And, but that is uh, a challenge. <laughs> Around the world, translation is still not as far along as you might think. How many languages would you guess there are in the world? Any informed guesses? Round numbers will do. Seven thousand two hundred languages. Out of that 7,200, that's just living languages. Uh, out of that, how many would you guess have a complete Bible? So it's sort of setting aside for the moment that sometimes translations are not great, but they're there. I try 725. So basically, only one out of 10 of the world's languages has a complete Bible. Does that sound to you like the way God would want things to be? No, and I think we would like to say, okay, I, I, want, to, I want to improve that situation. Now, if we go to the next slide, you can see one way of thinking about the remaining Bible translation task. And it's just, it's just one way of looking at it but it is a very concerted effort by 11 of the major Bible translation organizations. Um, if you were to ask, I think nine of the 11 are based in the US, so reflect some of that. They divided the world's languages by the number of speakers. So on the left are the language, represent, the, the circle on the left represents languages spoken by 500,000 or more people. The one in the center represents languages spoken by 5,000 to 500,000 people. And the one on the far right represents languages with fewer than 5,000 speakers. So here on the left, we're looking at languages with more than 500,000 speakers. The green represents 265 languages that do have a whole Bible, 254 more that are working toward having a full Bible. And there are 22 languages spoken by more than half a million people who do not, do not have any of the scripture and no translation project in the works. Does that surprise you? If you're joining the world mission uh, endeavor, if you're going to the nations, this is part of the reality. You could send people from your country to a large people group of over 500,000 population. It could be over a million, who knows? And there may not be any scripture and no translation even going on. So there's a challenge here, even for languages with lots of speakers. Then in the middle, that's uh, the languages spoken by 5,000 to 500,000 people. And again, you see there are many of them, but now we're, instead of talking about a whole Bible, of course, the first over here talks about the whole Bible. In the middle, we're just talking about the New Testament, just talking about the New Testament. And the green represents 1460, I think. Um, languages that have a New Testament, the yellow, those that are working on one, and then 500 plus almost 600 languages with no New Testament and no New Testament translation going on. Daunting. And the smaller languages, as you would guess, um, there are even less translation projects going on with them. And on the far end, and this is, reflects this one particular set of goals, it's actually not what I am advocating for. I'm advocating for the ideal, which is all the Bible for all languages. But recognizing the challenge that that poses, they've said, well, let's try to get something. Let's try to get some scripture into every language by 2033. That's sort of an arbitrarily chosen goal. But the idea that 2,000 years after Jesus left the earth. So I hope that you see there's lots of translation work to be done. The team that I lead, the Scripture Resource Team, 
has been working for a number of years to try to help our own IMB missionaries to deal with this reality. Uh, I did some analysis and I found that at any given time, we were working with 175 to 235 ethnic groups that had no scripture whatsoever. And that makes missionary work hard. When you have no scripture in the language that people understand best, that's a problem. So that's why we're talking about this today. So moving on, uh, you know, our people are our, our biggest human resources for this. And so that's why I'm coming to talk with you is that the African church, as we've talked about this week, is growing, it is influential, it needs to be more so. The world needs you to keep rising, to keep growing in number and in depth and taking your place, your God assigned place in the world Christian movement, including the mission movement. So we need to think about, okay, how can we make sure that Africans, African Christians, take the place that God would have you take in this endeavor? And one of the things that I think is really important to say is that Bible translation methodologies are changing. So if you have been part of a Bible translation project, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, you may not recognize some of the things today that were happening then. Let me just ask, have any of you been part of a Bible translation project where you were lead translator or one of the advisors or maybe on an advisory committee? Okay, so there are a few. With advances in technology and with a new realization of the enormous contributions that can be made by the majority world, Bible translation is changing. And this gives new opportunities for faculty members, seminaries, and others to play a significant role in what we're doing. Let me just suggest what some of those things might be. If you were to say, hey, you know, I, I, I realize this is an important topic. I realize it's integral to missions. What could I do on my campus or what could our institution do? Just some ideas to get you started thinking. First, encourage, and I think even more important than encouraging, model the use of Scripture in the languages that people understand best. By that I mean vernacular Scriptures, what some people call first language, the language you learned at home from your parents. And I should say at this point, I know I'm a foreigner and I know the language situation in Africa as, as everywhere else in the world is complicated. It's not merely a matter of communication clarity. There are also matters of social prestige and power and historic resentments between language community. And I, I know that all that comes into play. But what I'm arguing here as a matter of principle, I'm not even saying you should always use the mother tongue, but as a matter of principle to say, you as communicators recognize and commit to that you want to communicate in the language that serves best the people you're trying to communicate with. And if you have a command of another language beyond the one you use in your academic work, don't put that on the shelf. Now, I have made some assumptions, but you just help me. If you feel at home speaking another language in addition to the English or French or um, Portuguese you use in the classroom, would you stand? All the people who say, yeah, I speak another language in addition to the one I use in classroom. Right, stand? Go ahead, stand. We'll need this stretch. Yep. All right. Okay. All right, now, while you're standing, let me do another little survey. So you, you speak two languages. I'm assuming one of them is probably an indigenous African. Let's stay up. All right, how many of you who are standing right now, how many of them, how many of the language that you no, in addition to the one you're using for academic purposes, your indigenous language. How many of them have a complete Bible? Raise your hand if your indigenous language has a complete Bible. Okay? All right. Okay, hands down. How many of you, your language does not have a complete Bible? Okay. All right. 
Now, my judgment is that there are sizably more of you who come from a language that has a complete Bible. Now, I'm just asking, is there a correlation between the fact that you had access to the whole Bible in your mother tongue and the fact you've become what you've become as pastors, theological educators, and so forth? Did that help you? Okay, just have a seat. But what my appeal here to you is, is really think through the value of using that mother tongue or mother tongues if you acquired others. And one of the reasons is just what happens when people do this. Now, Judy Miller is here. Judy, would you, she's over here by the windows. Judy, this is her story. and She's been involved in some really innovative work with theological educators in West Africa, Togo especially, but also some neighboring countries. And the principal of a Togolese pastor school uh, welcomed a project that Judy and others facilitated to encourage uh, faculty members to develop biblical stories, told forms of biblical stories in their mother tongues, in the indigenous languages that they spoke. So they worked in teams, they created about 30 or 40 stories in each of those indigenous languages that they spoke. And the principal, though he felt a little awkward at first, he eventually really warmed to the, the project. The reason he felt awkward, it emerged later, is that somewhere along the way, he just moved into the French-speaking world and in academia, that you just, he spoke French all the time. And so he didn't use his mother tongue very often. Occasionally when he went back to you know, his home village and things like that. But he went back to his home village with this biblical story told in that indigenous language. And he told that story full force with all the uh, cultural elements that you use with a true treasured story. And the people in the congregation responded so positively, so powerfully. He just saw that a, an element of recognition, and not just recognition, not just understanding intellectually, but it connected at a level of heart that really impressed him. So that he came back from that and he said, boy, this project we're doing learning to put biblical stories into local languages and do it well. He said, there's real power in that. And so I just encourage you to experiment in similar way if you're in that same situation. Uh, and your model counts for a lot. And really what I'm arguing this for is to emphasize the importance of local languages. Because if you do not act like local languages are very important, then why Bible translate? I'm following Dr. Lawless here. How do you motivate students to do evangelism? Well, first convince them that the world is lost. How do you convince people that Bible translation matters? Well, talk to people who have no scripture in their language. Talk to people whose only access is in a language they don't understand well. One of the things that moved this principle is after the service, one of the women in, his, in the congregation, we've been there a long time, faithful attender, so, you know, thank, thank you so much for preaching today in our language. She said, you know, I, I so often I don't understand most of the French that the preacher uses. Okay, so value it, that's the starting point. Beyond that, the next, I encourage you to promote Bible translation and Bible translation consulting as integral parts of the Christian mission. I've already said a good bit about that, but is, you know, if you're trying to give students an accurate picture of what the world Christian movement missions movement is, this ought to be part of the discussion. Then third, I would ask you to consider how your ministry or the institution where you teach could give support to Bible translation. And there are a variety of ways to do this. I think we have some Cam Cameroonians present. They were seated here the other day. I, I don't know about your institutions uh, for sure, but I know the president of SIO International is a Cameroonian. Michel Kimonia, you know him? Yeah. Okay. And he reported that he had had wonderful cooperation from some of the churches in Cameroon promoting the importance of Bible translation, many of the things that I'm talking about here. So we have among us, you know, people from churches and seminaries. Or it, it, it could be as, as, uh, as simple as hosting a one day emphasis on your campus and invite people who are involved in Bible translation just to come tell their story. Or it can involve using someone, uh, maybe in a chapel service, who's a minority language speaker and who wants to give a testimony about what the transforming impact of the scripture was when it was in their 
heart and language. Or you can encourage students to apply for training programs where they get additional study. And I would say, if you have students that seem to have promise, encourage them to keep pursuing biblical language, keep pursuing linguistics, keep thinking about it, and support that possibility for them. Lots of ways this can be done, and I hope that we can ge generate some other ideas momentarily. A, a fourth option is that you as theological educators should be familiar with Scripture. You ought to be able to use commentaries with skill and understanding. And so you could play a role as a part of a Bible translation team, not as the primary translators, but as an exegetical advisor. So whatever portion of the Scripture they're working on at the time, you are available to be sort of a living Bible commentary to them. And this becomes especially significant because there's a shift happening in the world of Bible translation in that many of the Bible translations being done now are done orally. That is, they listen to Scripture in a source language, and then they seek to understand thoroughly what that is saying, and then to express it orally in the target language. So you have people who are involved in Bible translation who may not read at all, but who are great with language, know their language well, who are articulate and who uh, have a great command of language. But in that environment, then you need people who have access to theological books, commentaries, to serve as a sort of a living Bible commentary. And that is a role that you could play on a part-time basis. So, you know, meet with the team twice a year for a week as they prepare, and then be available to respond to individual questions. This fifth item is one uh, that I bring to you specifically at the request of the president of one of the major Bible translation groups. He approached me on behalf of the International Mission Board and said, you know, one of the big bottlenecks in getting the Bible translated is we do not have enough Bible translation consultants. These are skilled people, knowledgeable in the scriptures, who work with teams and help evaluate the quality of their work, help them think how to improve it. And he came to me with this proposal, and I'm making it to you as he made it to me. He said, if there are theological educators that IMB is relating to, here we are. He said, if, assuming that they have sort of a typical seminary experience, Greek, Hebrew, good knowledge of theology. He said, we would love to work with them to equip them to be a Bible translation consultant part-time. He said, if they would give us at least one month a year to work on Bible translation consulting, he said, we would be glad to mentor them, coach them, provide some of the specific detailed training that's needed to be a Bible translation consultant. He said, here we have all these knowledgeable people. Here we have all these people who have a good grasp of Scripture and theology, and they understand the culture, and they may speak a uh, related language to the one we're translating into, or maybe they speak the language we're translating into. He said, we would love to work with them. And so I'm here issuing an invitation on behalf of him, and uh, another one just in a moment. I suggest that you participate in the planning, the promotion, the conducting of regional conferences about Bible translation that are being, and being involved in supporting it. And something like this conference where you network with like-minded people, where you share ideas, you find out what others are doing, and you decide what you can do yourself. And so this kind of thing um, can go in all sorts of directions. So the next slide, please. What we're thinking about is, and I should say to you, uh, we are here to make a proposal and to get your feedback. Uh, ben Rainey's back here on the back. Ben, raise your hand. Ben is here with me, and Ben is helping us with NIMB to make this kind of initiative in various regions of the world where Bible translation need is high. So what, what if, so we're what ifing, we're running it by you, and we'll hope to hear back from you. What if we developed regional networks that included people like you, but also included um, people from Bible translation organizations, Bible societies, others, where we came together and we jointly sought ways to advance the Bible translation cause. There's no single prescripted way 
It's a matter of saying, hey, we are for this because God has guided us to it. And we'd like to get together annually or every other year and work together, sharing resources of people, resources of money, resources of education, and so forth, and move forward. May very well involve um, African churches and mission organizations as well. One of the things that's become very apparent is that as the majority world has entered into the missionary task, they have also embraced, Bible translation is a part of that, and in a number of instances, they've said, you know, the scriptures we have are inadequate. We are grateful for what the foreign Bible translators did years ago, but we know that it could be better. And so they're working to improve their own as well as using those skills in an effort to take the gospel to those who've never heard. So when we have a break later today, if you would like to talk more about this, find me, find Ben, and let's talk about just what you think about this proposal, whether you think it has relevance in your setting or not. So, discussion questions then. How well do your students understand Bible translation's role in Christian missions? Do they think that's just something white people do? Say, oh, that's the Bible translation organization? It's not for churches, not for mission agencies? Or do they see that it could be integral? Uh, Second, in what ways could you increase the involvement of your students in Bible translation? And then personally, what's one thing that you can do to advance Bible translation? Okay, so please turn to your groups and let's discuss these three questions. All right, if you could turn your attention this way. It sounds like you've gotten really excited about Bible translation or something. Um, I, I think I can guess the answer to number one, but you tell me. How well do your students understand Bible translation's role in Christian missions? They understand it really well. Sort of well. Bible what? Yeah. In what ways could you increase the involvement of your students in Bible translation? I mean, indirectly or directly. This may, they may be a Bible translator on the very front line, or maybe in some other ways. What did you, what did you see as possibilities for your students? So we have the microphone. Okay, back there toward the back. To begin with, we thought that is such a professional responsibility. <coughs> Our students might want to shy away from that. Mm-hmm. But we, we, we made a correlation between the, the professionalism and mission. Mm-hmm. Our students, once they understand the role of mission, they cannot go do mission in a place that they have no materials for. Mm-hmm. Part of mission is to take the word of God to the, to the tribe that does not have the word of God in a language mm-hmm. that people there would understand. Yeah. So, for, for mission to be effective, it needs to be done in a language that people understand on location. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that the students can be helped to understand very well. Mm-hmm. Before you do a mission for a particular end, you need to have the Word of God in their language so that they understand what is best for them. Yes, Yes. let me comment on that just a bit because you have described very well the kind of the classical approach and classical understanding. And part of my talk is to say the world is changing. And a few years ago, our organization was exactly what you've described. You know, what can we do until Bible is translated in a place? But we just said as an organization, we can't wait for the Bible translators. And so what we've developed is an approach that uses Bible stories that people learn uh, in the trade language typically, and then they learn to express that story in their own mother tongue. And one of the reasons we're doing this is because all those languages that are represented in those pie charts with no scripture, about 90% of those also do not have an alphabet or a writing system. 
So the challenge is that much bigger, and creating those writing systems is, is very technical, just like you were saying. So what we have done as an organization with our partners is we have developed sets of biblical stories, maybe 40, 50, 60, 70, carefully chosen, that they tell, polish, using processes we've borrowed from the Bible translation process. And that once they have heard 40 or 50 biblical stories in their mother tongue, told well by one of their own, then they're much more eager to cooperate. Say, are there more stories like this in the Bible? We say, oh, are there hundreds more? And they say, how could we get more of those? And then there's an impetus for the local people to participate. So as strange as it may seem, we've, we've now come to a point where in many, many cases, not just with IMB, but others as well, they have found that the best place to start a translation project is not with written translation, but with this oral or audio translation. Microphone, please. We also thought translation work is not necessarily written. Mm -hmm. And then we remember the Jesus film from Campus Crusade that has been translated into many other languages. Mm -hmm. So probably the first thing that we can look at, if, if the Bible is not in that language, we need to find out, has the Jesus film been translated mm -hmm. in the language for the the location where the mission mm -hmm. is targeting. Yeah, very good. All right. Yes, sir. What? Remember that, and then we we'll come here. Uh, from where he stopped in Nigeria, efforts have been made to go into translation of the Bible into different languages. Uh, why we are having uh, three major languages? already done and is used for us in our theological institutions, but we have about 500 different, mm -hmm. uh, what do I call it, uh, pardon? Dialects. And you have already responded positively mm -hmm. to the challenges facing the churches and the seminary in terms of alphabet, in terms of the level of literacy mm -hmm. in those areas. And uh, uh, what the seminary and the theological institutions mm -hmm. in our context do most times is that uh, we have Bible Society of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We have got some schools, some institutions like Ubomasho, mm -hmm. where certain pastors have interest in translating the scriptures and they were encouraged. But the challenge there is that having translated, you must go through the Bible Society of Nigeria through some scholastic editing, mm -hmm. making sure that your translation does not change the meaning. It's not exegetic you are doing. You are really doing the exegesis. Because it's very, very important. Some may be quoting out of, they may be translating it from their subjective mindset not from the real Greek mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, Hebrew uh, understanding of it. This is very, very important. That's why the work of translation appears to be very, very difficult and may not be able to handle it by a seminary. At the same time, the seminary institutions must try to encourage mm -hmm. the students as they are graduating through the teachings of the New Testament and Old Testament hermeneutics to get this thing as a project which we have to embark on as we have been doing now and to make sure that we meet the needs of the future. Mm -hmm. However, it is not a it is not a, an easy task, very cumbersome by what we are having as resources is concerned and as the alphabet uh, is also concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm also not all of this uh, uh, tribes or ethnic groups are uh, already uh, touched by the gospel. Mm -hmm. And the essence of doing it is to making sure that in the nearest future, mm -hmm. gospel must be able to reach them in their own mother's tongue. We are praying that and God will help us as we go on strategically. Yeah. All right, thank you. You have described well many of the challenges, and I appreciate that resolve. 
And your description is exactly why we are proposing a, a network, a, a Baptist Bible translation network, a regionally, because many, many people in the room, I'm sure, are thinking, yes, we have some of the very same challenges. And just like with IB10, you are helping each other find the way forward. We're proposing a similar thing with respect to Bible translation. So mission and trans translation are moving together, whereas historically, just as you described, translation did its thing, and then when they were finished, then missions could begin. No, no, we're saying we're not waiting for them. That's, that's no criticism of them, just it's a big challenge.